as in every religion, there are extremists. So these Buddhist extremists believe that we were drugging people to convert them into Christianity. Yeah, so my, my mum was tortured, my dad was burnt. And uh, I remember sometimes we had to like, when we know they were coming, we had to go and hide. Like I remember one time we were hiding in the cemetery, just like waiting for them to go away. But when I started school in Gloucester, I had the ability to actually make friends, sort of start living a life where I wasn't scared of being killed every night. <laughs> it just, it just, I had that worry like all my, all my life really, just not knowing when I'd be sent back or if I'd be sent back. Um, if you're an asylum seeker, you're not allowed to work. You're not allowed to work? No. So we had ID, IDs saying employment prohibited. The situation there was horrible where like the toilets were shared between like so many people not cleaned and it's just not not human living conditions if I'm honest. Uh, I got to my room one day I was literally broke down crying I was like uh, what have I done for me to like be in a situation like this. Callum thanks for uh, coming on mate welcome to the Everyday Perspective podcast. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it mate. Um, so I understand you've not always lived in the UK. Um, you had a little bit of a journey getting here. So um, it'd be great to go back to the very beginning of, um, I guess, where you kind of started life, how you grew up and, and what happened from there. Yeah, so uh, I was born in a beautiful island called Sri Lanka. It's just off uh, next to India. Mm -hmm. uh, beautiful country. I was uh, born there, spent 12 years over there. Um, so my family were doctors. So um, we had our own private surgery and also we had our own medical mission. So we'd go out into like areas where people couldn't afford medication and we'd do like medical camps. But my dad was also an evangelist, so he was he wanted to spread the gospel. Mm -hmm. And that's where the issues started happening. Because Sri Lanka is a very strong Buddhist country and it's, it's very proud. It's a very strong of, Buddhist country. Yes, yeah. is it? And it's very proud of its, uh, yeah. its uh, I guess, patriotism. Pa Patriotism. Right. <laughs> <Patriots. laughs> yeah, yeah. um, and so to be a true Sri Lankan, they say you should be Sinhalese and Buddhist. Is that across the whole country? Uh, generally, yeah. It's, it's starting to change now a bit with the nationalities. So right. Sri Lanka has two different nationalities, Sinhalese and Tamils. Okay. Right. And Sinhalese makes the majority of the population. And Tamils... Uh, what, what's, what's the difference, is it? Um, so Tamils are usually in the north of Sri Lanka, um, closer to India, and they speak a different language, their culture is different. Um, I think it's believed that they migrated over from India and Sinhalese people are the majority who have seen. Do they speak, do they speak same, same languages? No, they speak two different languages. What languages do they speak? So Tamil is, they speak Tamil. Oh, okay. And uh, Sinhalese people speak Sinhala. Oh, right. So, okay. A lot of, so does it cause a lot of like friction and divide and stuff like that? There was a civil war for years and years, which only ended a few years ago. Oh, really? So, yeah. So Tamils... Tamils are obviously normal people, but mm -hmm. they had their uh, terrorist group okay. called LTTE. You might have heard of, about that. No, I've never heard of that. Um, so there was lots of suicide bombers and... All going on in Sri Lanka? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I didn't know. It was to the point where people were scared to actually live their life normally because, you know, getting on the bus, there could be a bomb. Oh, or, no you know. How, how big is the country? Because I know the po I think the population is around 20 million, somewhere yeah, around it's there. It's a right? very small country, yeah. like a fraction of the size of the UK. Yeah, I think yeah. it's, yeah, I think the population is like maybe just over double that of London. Okay. So it's pretty yeah. small, but yeah. I don't know what the landmass is like. I know it's an island mm. state, isn't it? Or country? Yeah, I can't recall the landmass. Yeah, I know okay. it's very small. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it takes a few hours to get through. <laughs> if the roads were as good as the UK, it probably takes a few yeah. hours. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so hard to, to, hard to get away from that sort of stuff then, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. But, um, Nationality was our Sinhalese, so we never had any issues with that. Yeah. Apart from when we were preaching about equality, they didn't quite like that. So, that, so what religion was your dad or Christian, your family? So we Christian, were Christian, yeah. yeah. And so, a they didn't like the fact that we were evangelizing Christians, and also the fact that we were saying we are equals and we shouldn't be treating Tamils differently just because of their nationality. So it was. Was your like surgery? I know you said your dad had uh, your mum and dad had a like a like a surgery, yeah, and then you had your missions and stuff. Was was the surgery successful or was it, was yeah, it unsuccessful yeah, that, that, because that. of that? Uh, no, it was successful because my my mum was a really good doctor, okay, yeah, she, she's been on the newspaper for some of the things she's done, she's amazing, and of the medical missions she did helped a lot of people as well, right? Okay, um, but unfortunately, 
as in every religion, there are extremists. Okay. So these Buddhist extremists believe that we were drugging people to convert them into Christianity. What <laughs> from the from the missionary yeah, stuff that yeah, like yeah, you were doing? Yeah, what yeah. The you, fuck? you obviously know that's not really possible. <laughs> so, so you're going out into the local community and helping people, yeah, and then yeah. because your religions didn't match up, they would then yeah exactly, say that you're drugging yeah. people. Like you know, even during the tsunami, we went out and uh, helped people. I remember I was a child. I went there and uh, helped. Well, I couldn't help much from there. <laughs> right, okay, yeah. I was writing my fake prescriptions. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> um, but yeah, no. So they they didn't like the fact that we were evangelizing Christians. I think it probably goes back to when Sri Lanka was invaded by Western countries, right. and generally it was under the guise of missionary work. Right. So they probably have a um, idea that if you are a Christian, you're a traitor to the nation. So what stemmed your family to become Christian? Um, so my dad was a uh, Christian originally. And then when... Was that passed on from like his family, like heritage or was it... He no, he, he was originally Buddhist as well. Okay. And I think he's had an experience where he came to know God and then he converted into okay. Christianity. So he'd done that on his own sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. And then he wanted to spread that good news to everyone else. And obviously he met mum and then mum also converted and then... I was, I was born into a Christian family. Okay. Um, and then um, what happened was, got to the point where we had to move to so many different cities to stay safe, uh, stay safe, because people would come marching against us. Uh, like we had people with banners, like- June uh, marching, what, like, so like, like hundreds of people? Yeah. Or something? What, yeah, marching people. against your family? Yeah, yeah. yeah so like, were you part of like a wider Christian community or was it literally so, just your family? No, so what happens is you go, if you're in your area, you'd start like a community where you start evangelizing to them. Mm -hmm. And then they would, you know, you'd start like a small house group where you start worshiping together, praying together. Okay. And then obviously it grows if people, more people come to the community. So they didn't want that to happen. So because your family looked like maybe they were the head of that organization, yeah. that's what was, what was the issue? That's it, yeah, yeah. And I know I've been to about five, six different schools uh, when I was younger, because we had to keep moving. So I, I never got the ability to actually form any friendships. So, you know, like build a proper community around me because you never know when you'll pack up and move overnight because, yeah. you know, things get bad. So did you have issues at school as well because of religion and because I guess you were new and, and not there for very long? I didn't have issues because of my religion at school, mm -hmm. but just being a new kid all the time felt a bit bit uh, disheartening really like mm. you know you're, you're already going into a school where they already have friendship groups they already have their cliques and mm -hmm. you just it's always feel like you're an outsider like you don't belong yeah okay yeah. and you mentioned there was quite a lot of sort of marching and protesting was there ever any violence towards your family yeah so my my mum was tortured my dad was burnt and uh, i remember sometimes we had to like when we know they were coming, we had to go and hide. Like, I remember one time we were hiding in the cemetery, just like waiting for them to go away. And then we'd go back and it's safe. So when you say your mum was tortured, like what do, you, what do you mean by that? Yeah, so they basically came into the house, like, you know, burnt the place and then, yeah, did a lot of bad things. And then, I mean, we even, obviously we went to the police about it and all the police did was they tried to come in once a day to sign a logbook, which obviously didn't help. Um, but yeah. And you said your dad got burnt. How did they, what did they do? The same sort of, was that the same incident or was that separate incident? A separate incident. It was, so most of these incidents I was quite sheltered from because we would be sent yeah, somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. But you know, I've seen the burn marks all down his legs. Just, oh, uh, yeah. That's a, that must have been so hard to grow up with. I can even probably imagine that sort of fear. And to you growing up with that, it must have seemed did it seem normal that you moved around um, and that you were worried? To be honest, like just trying to think of everything that's happened, it's all like a blur in my head. Like I struggle to recall like a lot of the details of like what happened. Mm -hmm. I tend to remember later years more, uh, but like early on, yeah. I tend to not remember most of it because I think my brain's just trying to filter it out. Yeah, mm -hmm. I can imagine. Yeah, it's such traumatic experiences, isn't it? Like from a young age, you do, do filter it out. Yeah, such tenacity from your parents, though, to continue, like, spreading the gospel, <laughs> yeah. despite you must like, really how much persecution they were having. Yeah, yeah. I guess when you have faith and you believe something and it, and it's real to you, and you, you want to tell that good news to other people naturally. 
yeah. when it's, it's even like jujitsu when you know the benefits of jujitsu you wanna go tell everyone else like yeah. how, how great it is yeah, yeah we've been doing it for about 13 weeks so far wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we converted a few yeah. we converted a few yeah we had a few come in the door yeah you need more yeah <laughs> yeah you do everyone should do it yeah that's that's mad and, and was there ever an occasion where have you got siblings Yes, yeah, so I got a sister. Okay. She's a couple of years younger than me. Yeah. And you said you, you, you were there till you were 12. Yeah. Were, were either of you ever sort of put at risk? I know obviously every time they turned up, you were at, to some level of risk, but you obviously said you went off and hid. Yeah. Was there ever any occasions where you actually came face to face with these people? Kind of like, I remember vaguely, like uh, we had a guy come to our house with a knife and then uh, it was actually followed by some monks as well. And they... <laughs> They were threatening to attack us and kill us, and then obviously we went and hid. But <laughs> it, it it sounds bizarre. Was, like, was your family was, fairly wealthy? Yeah, my parents are both doctors. So yeah, that's what had, I thought. Yeah, yeah but they, we, were, they, we were well off. Like I was, yeah. was one of those uh, spoiled kids. <laughs> <laughs> so, so being wealthy in Sri Lanka does that does that not buy you a level of security? I know in places like Brazil, they've got like gated communities for for those that are affluent. Um, were, were were there opportunities to to go somewhere like that, or were the gated communities the problem? Um, I, d I don't think there's like a gated community for Christians. Right. Okay. Um, I mean, even recently, a few years ago, there was attacks on churches where they bought, um, there was a suicide bomber that even still blew up a church. Wow. And at the moment, there's a a big rise up against Christians at the moment. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it's it's not stopped. Yeah. It's still still going on. What happens is if you're like a Catholic, you're not an evangelistic Christian, mm -hmm. they tend to just let you be. But if you're out there actively evangelizing, then they don't. Is that what they don't like the preaching and the trying to convert people into That's it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting, isn't it? Like, <laughs> you always think of Buddhism as a, quite a uh, peaceful, peaceful mm. calm, you know, yeah. monks, I guess with any and... religion, like, you got people who are normal believers. Yeah, yeah, and then you got people who are extremists who kind of use religion again as a as, sorry as a way of I don't know like inflicting pain on other people because of their tendency to do so and not because of the religion. Yeah, or they may be believing that they're doing the right thing. Yeah, you, you, yeah. yeah. I mean, Islam's obviously a prime example, but I know in the states I think you get Christians who are extremists as well so you get it I think across all religions don't you of course yeah but it, but it sounds like there were quite a lot though I mean you know sort of you think about the UK and of course it's different overseas I know but in the UK I don't know you know think about Islamic extremists you know and they're, they're, they're very small little pockets aren't they in the general sort of Islamic communities uh, are yeah. completely against them but it sounds yeah. like in your experience from what you're saying that actually were quite large contingents of these extremists or these these Buddhists who are coming in. Yeah, I think it filters down from the government because government is a strong Buddhist government. Is it? Okay. And even got a lot of monks in high positions in the government. Right. Okay. You know, if, if you um, yeah look up some videos of Sri Lankan parliaments, you see monks literally fighting and all sorts. So. <laughs> no way. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I think it filters down from the hierarchy. And, and is that it's probably why you don't get a massive amount of help from the the police and no, all that sort of stuff? Because they probably were kind of against you as well. Yeah, yeah, I that's absolutely so. mental, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So, so was there like a you know what what at what point did you decide to leave the country? Or your parents decide. Was there a particular incident that led to them going right enough's enough? Um, I think they were getting like more and more and more death threats. Yeah. And the worse it got, they just decided it's, it's not safe for us. And until the day we were leaving, we didn't know we were leaving. Right. So I remember being at school and then I got pulled off school, mm. went home, packed our bags and left. It was it's so sudden that, you know, when we left, we were left in a, have you ever seen a tuk-tuk? Yeah, yeah. 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 Left in a tick tick with the sides down, so no one could uh, see us. Yeah. Um. So yeah, my parents basically sold the house, sold everything to. For, so, what we didn't know until later is that you could apply for the um, visa yourselves, but because we didn't know that we had to overpay an agent like stupid amounts of money mm -hmm. to um, apply the visa for us. Okay. And why did why did you choose the UK? Um, I well, what didn't. Why not? Yeah, your parents. Honestly, I have no, that's one thing we haven't really spoken about. But I, I do remember briefly being mentioned that because it's a Christian country, that you know they believe 
they would actually give us asylum or like help us in that situation. Yeah. And and when you were sort of at home in Sri Lanka, like what was your perception of the UK? Did you even have one? Yeah, I mean I've only seen it in T V. Yeah, okay. And, uh, you know, it was very proper and, <laughs> and nice. Um and it, it was quite a major shock when I actually got to the UK. It it wasn't what I expected to be honest. Yeah, okay. Um, and and how what was your means of transportation? So we got the plane. You got a plane, yeah. yeah okay, yeah. fine. And it was well, a direct um, thirteen hour flight. Yeah, okay. And did you already speak any English at this point? Yeah, so so in Sri Lanka, if you come from like a fairly well of family, you grow up speaking English. So I've always spoken English. So I didn't have that difficulty um, speaking English. Yeah, yeah, okay. So you got a flight into the UK. Was that into London? Yeah, we came to London okay. and then we were in Croydon. Yeah. Went to the home office, which is also in Croydon. Mm -hmm. And then uh, basically applied for asylum. They put us in a van and sent us to Cardiff. Okay. So Cardiff is where they first send you if you apply for asylum and you don't have anywhere to stay. Yeah. They put you in like a place for asylum seekers. Yeah, okay. So just going back a, a quick step. So when you arrive in, in the UK, um, so it, you said you already had visas, so you were able just to get through border control, okay? Yeah. And then from there, you just made your way straight to the home office and, and put in an application. Yes. And what what's, do you... Do you recall probably not at the time but do you are you aware now of what that process looks like um yeah i think you just go in you fill out some forms and sort of try to explain your situation yeah. put the application in and then you also go back to your accommodation if you have any or you can request for accommodation which we did mm -hmm. they send you there and then the paperwork will start yeah. um so if you can't afford a, a lawyer they will provide you like a legal aid lawyer. Yeah, okay. And they will fight on your behalf. Mm -hmm. And the home office obviously will have their own lawyers who will try to deny you the uh, asylum. Yeah, okay. So it's like a fight against each other is what you're trying to say. Like yeah, it's one yeah. side saying, no, it's you it's should a, get out. And one side you should yeah. try to get you in. Yeah. It's interesting. I guess it's very similar to criminal law, isn't it? Where you so I just yeah, just yeah. I just exactly thought exactly the same. <laughs> but yeah. for my battle, it took fifteen years. Fifteen. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So there's what a... from the time you got to the UK to actually get asylum? In the yeah. UK? Yeah. It took right, 15 okay. Years. All right. So let's let's get back to Cardiff then. So yeah. you land in South Wales. Probably not what you saw on TV. Yeah? <laughs> no. I mean, even London. <laughs> like, like, the Tivoli. I was very shocked. <laughs> <laughs> I was very shocked to see like the attached houses. I've never seen that before. Okay. Um. You know, in Sri Lanka, all houses are detached. You know, you got big land um and seeing attached houses i was like are these offices and someone told me no these are houses <laughs> like, <"Wow." laughs> my mind was blown <laughs> um and yeah and then well, it, was, it, was, it was we came in september uh and for us it was freezing <laughs> mm, <laughs> oh, yeah it was coming from cold, like yeah. 30 odd degrees and it's you know you must have thought it was fucking horrendous by january <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you got to january like shit <laughs> honestly yeah um, and then we didn't have any like warm clothing and we didn't have any money to afford the clothing because we came I think we came with like 100 pounds each because yeah. we had to spend so much money on getting here and then we had like tea towels wrapped around our hands <laughs> because it was cold um, and then we had to go from our place we stayed which is like one room so we've all packed into one like tiny room and we had to walk for a bit to get our food so you get fed by the same people. Um, you get like chicken nuggets and stuff like that. Just right, kinda, okay. Was it nice? <laughs> at, at, at the time, it was like, yeah, British food. Is nice. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. And then yeah. soon we started missing uh, real food. Yeah. <laughs> what, was, what was Sri Lankan cuisine like? Um, it's basically rice and curry Is mainly. It? Okay, yeah. And lentils. There's a lot of vegetarian stuff, but yeah. also lot of chicken and meat so. yeah okay so yeah quite different to chicken nuggets then yeah, yeah, yeah quite over, yeah. <laughs> not Fast a lot food. of processed food over there pot noodles <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and what was the um what was the accommodation like that you landed in initially <laughs> obviously attached but um <laughs> yeah it wasn't great honestly um i mean the cleanliness and things like that it it wasn't good but at the time we couldn't couldn't really complain like it was it was somewhere to stay um but until later, the second time I went to there, which I'll go into later, that's when I realised how bad it actually is. Um, but yeah, we were in that accommodation and one time we were walking to get food yeah. and we saw a sign for a church. And we thought, oh, let's go, let's go check it out. 
and we walked over to the church, tried knocking on the door and there's no one there. So we uh, just rang the number to see what, what time it was open. And then um, someone answered and they were actually in the church. So they came out and they, he was called Pastor Alex. He's a Scottish pastor working in, uh, in Wales. In Wales. <laughs> <laughs> and he came out and he spoke to us. But you can understand him. This is in English, what is it? The Glaswegian yeah. accent. <laughs> that's, some, that's one accent I still struggle with. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine, yeah. <laughs> And then, um, yeah, he was so nice to us. I couldn't believe it. In, in, he took us to Tesco. He bought us jackets, gloves and... No way. He bought us a nice rice cooker so we can cook some rice and some... I think that right there, though, is the two extremes of religion. Mm. Where you can go from one place and it's hatred and thing. And then the other side of religion mm. is, is yeah. a community of like, helpfulness and mm. people, you know. Yeah. And that that was one of the first things that sort of gave me a, a bit of hope. Like, yeah. there are, like, good people. Yeah. There, yeah, yeah, of course there are, yeah. yeah. And, and were there any other families or asylum seekers sort of in, in and around your accommodation? Yeah, there were. Well, they're obviously from all different countries, yeah. so we couldn't really talk to each other yeah. or understand each other. Yeah. A lot of them didn't speak English, yeah, okay. so communication was an issue. Yeah, yeah. it was. Um, it's one of those experiences where, unless you are there, it's hard to explain. Like, mm. you almost feel like you get bunched together in a, in a cage and you expect to just get on with each other. Mm. So, did you go from that point? Did you then? Did they look at you know schools for you or what what was the what no, was the so, next step once you so got from you Cardiff go into the, the so Cardiff like a dispersal location where they you stay there until you get your case um onto the home office and then once they start processing your case you can apply for something called a uh, section 95 support right what's that so, so that's the support asylum seekers get while their case is ongoing right okay so what that does is they will find you accommodation and also they will support your living costs. And that's um, five pounds a day per person. So that's for like, your food, travel, transport and everything. Five pounds a day? Yeah. yeah. What, what year was this? This was in, so 2007. 2007, okay. And it's still, I think it's 37 pounds 50 per week per person at the moment. Mm. So it's still around just, just over five pounds. Yeah, it's really tough to live off that, isn't it? Yeah, it was. I mean, if it wasn't for the community that helped us, I don't, I don't know how, how we would have made it. And yeah, we, so what they did was they found us a place in Gloucester. So they, you know, we got on this vehicle overnight, went over to Gloucester. They gave us some accommodation. And um, then we had to find schools and stuff ourselves. So um, we found like a local organisation that helps refugees. And we went there and they sort of helped us find schools and get settled in the community. So what, where was that to? In Gloucester? In Gloucester, that yeah. That was your first school, yeah? Yeah. How, how old were you at that point then? I was about 12, 13. 12, 13, yeah. yeah. So, so I went into quickly. year eight. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. I bet I was a <laughs> going into year eight at school in Gloucester. What was that like? Honestly, um, <laughs> <laughs> first lesson I went to was an art lesson. Right. I went into the school, sat there. And at first thing, I was just shocked, like how the kids were speaking to the teachers. They were swearing at the teachers and, you know, <laughs> in Sri Lanka, your teacher walks into the room, you stand up, say, good morning. <laughs> really? Good morning, sir. Good morning, madam. Like, so was the contrast between school in Sri Lanka to, to UK, like it's, it's huge, huge difference. huge difference, like the culture. Or just with like respect and... Yeah, yeah. I mean, it took like half an hour for the class to settle down and start the lesson. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's, 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 that's school, to be fair. <laughs> it's a free-for-all, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, it was, it was crazy. Um, but thankfully, like, kids are really friendly. Were they, and, were they okay with you, yeah? Yeah, there's uh, one, one person, the uh, first person that spoke to me was uh, someone called Michael Berry. Okay. I'm uh, still, still in contact with him. Um, he came over, spoke to me, sort of showed me around the school. And that was like amazing. He didn't have to do that, you know. And then next day I met another friend at the bus stop um, called Matthew. He's now living in Vietnam. He's an English teacher there. <laughs> wow. yeah, I'm actually cool. meeting him uh, when I go to Malaysia. He's going to oh, fly nice. to see me. That's cool. Um, but then, yeah, he spoke to me and slowly started making friends. Yeah. And um, so Matthew was a Christian as well. So he, um, he had something in common to start to, you know, get to know each other. 
and then I made other friends. And honestly, the friendships I made in school that year, they've lasted a lifetime. Yeah, that's really cool. I mean, last um, last few days, I had a friend from Gloucester come down and visit me. Yeah. You know, after even after so many years of <laughs> moving from Gloucester, they, yeah. you know, we're still in contact. How, how long was you in Gloucester for then? Uh, about ten years, I, I believe. Yeah. Ten years. So at that point, then was your application i know you said it took 15 years yeah he was there for say 10 years your application did it change did they try and move you did they you know what was that like maybe living under a a blanket of uncertainty all the time what was that like yeah so basically i was going to school like a like a normal child and i was trying to live like a normal life but every now and then we'd um, get like a letter saying your case is rejected and then we'd have to go through like an appeal process. Right. And uh, also at the same time, because you don't have like a permanent stay or like a uh, guaranteed stay in the UK, right. you could literally get a knock on the door at night and be put on a flight. So even like in the daytime when you get a knock on the door, like we, we get scared. Yeah. I mean, still, if I hear a knock on the door, I shake a little bit. <laughs> and yeah. if, if that was to happen, would that be back to Sri Lanka or would they send you to like a, another safe country? Don't they, It'd be back to Sri Lanka. Would it really? Yeah. Wow, okay. Don't they, don't they move, go to, don't they um, transport people now to like Rwanda? Or yeah, like like that. Be, yeah. Yeah. There's been a bit yeah. of a kickoff with that, hasn't there? Yeah. Like it's just yeah. been it's crazy <laughs> that, isn't it? Imagine that. <laughs> get shipped off to Rwanda yeah. there you so, go. just to yeah. think about it like yeah it'd, it'd be like I had that worry like all my all my life really mm -hmm. just not knowing when I'd be sent back or if I'd be sent back mm -hmm. and um, just living with that alone was like part of your brain felt like it was just taken up constantly yeah. it's like constantly running in the back of the head like I'm not like everyone else at school you know? I have other things going on that I have to worry about but for the most part i managed to have a a good sort of um childhood in the uk yeah. um because obviously in sri lanka because we moved around so much i never got that social experience or mm -hmm. the ability to make friends and like maintain friendships exactly. but when i started school in gloucester i had the ability to actually make friends sort of start living a life where I wasn't scared of being killed every night. <laughs> it's just, it's just, no, it's just that safety you have. Yeah. Although you had other things going on, but that safety was a big, big deal. So it was good in Gloucester then. So what did you, did you finish your GCSEs? Yes, yeah, so I did my GCSEs and then I went to a different school to do my A-levels. Okay. What was so within Gloucester, yeah? Yeah, yeah, St. Peter's I went to. And then I, I was doing my sciences for A levels, and during that time, it's kind of when I really found out I'm an asylum seeker, because um, when I applied to university, I got in, I got a place to study, but I couldn't start university because you can't get student finance if you're an asylum seeker. Flatly, you can't get it. No, no, unless um, you can pay for the degree yourself. You know, it's yeah, which is impossible. Yeah, it's twenty-one grand a year. Yeah. <laughs> so, so what? What's the what? What was the working situation then during this period? Because obviously, your your parents had a very useful, you know, sort of set of skills. Yeah. yeah. So again, when when you come over, you can't work un until you get your refugee status. Yeah. Um, if you're an asylum seeker, you're not allowed to work. You're not allowed to work. No. So we had ID IDs saying employment prohibited. So. <laughs> <laughs> so. That and seems fucking mental. You've got two doctors that would yeah. be willing to yeah. work, even if they had to do maybe some sort of, I don't know, top up or something just to make sure it was up to UK standard. I don't know how it works, but but it seems absolutely mental to say that, you know, you've got two people that are highly educated. Yeah. And willing to work. And willing but, to work, but weren't allowed. Yeah. So that whole time then, so your parents for 15 years, I assume you got asylum all at the same time? Yeah. So for 15 years, they couldn't work. No. And they lived off, like you said, five uh, pounds a day. Yeah, for that whole time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, honestly, like looking at it now that I'm working and I'm, you know, earning a bit of money, that I don't, I can't imagine how I did that back then. Yeah, and you know, thankful to my parents, they never let us feel too, you know, too needy. And and thanks to the community in Gloucester, 
the church were amazing. They lo- they've always supported us from day one. And you know, the church family was like my family. Because I didn't have a family in Sri Lanka even. Um, my mum's uh, sibling, um, brothers, they died at a young age. Okay. And the rest of her family didn't want much to do with her because she's a Christian now. So, <laughs> you know, I have my grandma. Uh, she lived with us in Sri Lanka. Okay. But she couldn't come with us. So she stayed over there. But far, apart from that, I didn't really experience a whole, like a family situation. Mm-hmm. That's then in Gloucester, I felt like now I finally got a, a family. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, even my friends at school, they felt like family to me. Mm-hmm. And I built this whole community in Gloucester. Mm-hmm. Um, and then all of a sudden, got a letter saying, your case has been rejected. You got 24 hours to leave your accommodation. What, after 10 years of being in Gloucester? Yeah. So <laughs> Just so you would have been a young adult the, in your 20s at this point? Uh, I believe so. It was it was a few years after my A levels. So yeah. what did you do in between your A levels? Sorry, um, so I, I wasn't allowed to work, and I'm I'm just not the kind of person that want to sit around and not do anything. Mm. I always wanted to do something to give back to the society because you know, pe- although the government's not been great, people have looked after me. They've been amazing to me, and I wanted to give back. So that's when I started volunteering at church at different charities in Gloucester. And I just tried to give something back while also fighting the Home Office. You know, you had to go to London, talk to the lawyers, like do paperwork. So I had all of this on me. So I had to kind of grow up really fast and be the man of the house. So our, um, our family separated. Yeah. So we lost our dad. And so we had to, I had to step up. What age was that? That was probably around... 18. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Sorry, you had not 18. Um, yeah. A-levels are around 18. A-levels. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you finish your A-levels at 18. Yeah. So, it's around, was, around 18. so it's between 16 and 18. Yeah. 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 So yeah, you would have had a grown up fast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Especially in that situation where you've, um, you've got your very little money to, to live on. You know, it, probably all that to culture is If you're, if you're a boy, you look after your family. Yeah, of course you do. Yeah. yeah. So, I took on the responsibility of looking after my mum, my sister, and all the paperwork. And yeah, it was quite quite stressful for me. But then again, I think it's a cultural thing where we, as men, can't show our emotions to our family. So I, I you know, I obviously, that's when I found jujitsu to help me. Um, but I still had to be strong for my family. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it was, it was a tough time for me personally. Yeah, was there ever a temptation to to maybe work illegally and do like cash and hand work or anything? It's always crossed my mind, mm. but then it always like um, always challenged my own sort of integrity and things I've been brought up with. You now I've always been brought up to be honest, to to work for what I have, and you know if I'm going to build a life in the UK, I don't want to start off uh, building my life in the wrong way. And that's what I always believed. Like, you know, if I keep doing what I'm doing, I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm try- actively trying to be a better person every day. Some, you know, it, it will work out. I mean, I'm a Christian, so I believe God had a plan for me. And everything I went through when I, you know, when I was younger, he's used that to help other people. So, you know, when I got kicked out of the house and I was homeless, I got to experience how horrible being homeless is and the challenges that come with it. I mean, I've seen people with addiction, I've seen, I mean, I've seen everything. And then that motivated me to help out people who are homeless and people who are suffering with addiction. So when you say you were homeless, was this when you got sent back to London? So can we pick that back up where you were? Yeah, so um, so we got a letter saying you got 24 hours to leave yeah. the house. And then, you know, we, I was completely frozen. My friends from school, um, they came and they were packing my room for me because I didn't know what to do. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine like you lived there for 10 years, house full of stuff. Yeah, God. And you've just been told you got 24 hours. And, to... and is it just literally a letter? No one comes to explain or anything, just a letter? It's a letter. Um, and then you know, I had nowhere to put our stuff. So, you know, my friends literally loaded carfuls of stuff into their cars, took it to their houses. And, uh, you know, I had uh, my pastor from my church. He came and helped us a lot as well. And... We managed to get things out of the house and we were waiting in the house and we had like this massive group of uh, people come to kick us out of the house. How many? 
What, uh, like, about, what, from the government? five people from immigration. Mm. And uh, we were like, can we please have like one, two days to sort something out? And they were like, no. And they were like, no, you, you've got to go. So you, you, was it literally 24 hours notice that you got? Yeah. Was it? Okay. And then we, we left and then pa my pastor took us to this um, shelter for homeless uh, young people. What? The, sorry, they, they, just, they just evicted you? Yeah. You got to leave and they give you no other accommodation? No, because you know, if your case is re rejected, you've got no um, no right to have support to so your accommodation. So what to your financial side? Did they stop that, that stopped, as well? That stopped as well. So I assume that if you get rejected, they'd at least take you to the airport. I was about to say, yeah. <laughs> the port, so, yeah. so what do they expect you to do with no money? How are you supposed to get to the airport in <laughs> the country? <laughs> I have no idea. Honestly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I just got. I'm sorry. I'm just fucking gobsmacked. Like, yeah. you yeah. know, I, I'm not saying I understand, but if they're gonna make you homeless, then they've surely got to deport you to then, you know, what I mean, to to go back home or yeah. to go to wherever they're gonna send you at least. I think they they say you have to make your own way there or something like that. Uh, <laughs> but they won't let you work and they stop your money. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was insane. Yeah, but. I was in this homeless shelter for young people, and uh, which is a great place. It's called Night Stop, I believe. So did it's, you, all your family, or was it just you and your sister? Me and my sister. My mum uh, stayed with one of our church friends. Mm. They had a spare room, so they, she stayed there. And then um, this homeless place was basically, if you've got a spare room in your house, you can offer it to any homeless young people, where they can come stay for a night. Right. And that helped massively to sort of, and I have somewhere safe to stay while getting things sorted. Mm. And then basically what we found is the Home Office hadn't looked up at our paperwork properly and they've just rejected it on no basis. Right. So <laughs> then we got, <laughs> we got the right to appeal again for the, like the millionth time. <laughs> and they still haven't, like we've given them bundles and bundles of evidence and everything. They've not managed to look at any, any of it. Mm. Uh, so once we appealed, we got entitled to support again. So then what happened is they've said, you've got to go to Cardiff, which was the place we used to stay in mm -hmm. before. Yeah. But now that I'm 18, over 18, and my sister's over 18, we weren't treated as a family. So what happened was they sent my mum and sister to Cardiff first, and I was still homeless. I was still waiting for my support. And um, yeah, they sent them over there, and that's where my sister developed her like, um, OCD. Because the situation there was horrible, where like the toilets were shared between like so many people, not cleaned, and it's just not not human living conditions, if I'm honest. Mm. Um, and yeah, she developed really bad mental health issues from just you know being in there for a few weeks. And but what happened was um, they've got me to Plymouth from there. We've never heard of Plymouth. Don't know what, <laughs> what Plymouth was. Yeah. Uh, all of a sudden, they got told you're going to Plymouth, and what, this is, your mum and your sister. Yeah, yeah. And this is this is because um, we had a big community that was helping us. So you know, when, whenever we had a court case or anything to do with our asylum case, we had a you know massive bus full of people coming to support us. And uh, I don't think the Home Office liked that. They wanted to move us away from that community we have, and the furthest they could do it while still being in Southwest was Plymouth. <laughs> so they were like, you're still close to your community because you're in Southwest. Mm. <laughs> but you know. Three you, hours away. Three hours away, uh, yeah. On a coach is five and a half yeah, hours. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we can't afford the luxuries of a train. <laughs> yeah, yeah, God. <laughs> and then I was still uh, in Gloucester. Then I got moved to Cardiff. Mm. And by the time I got to Cardiff, my mum and sister were moved to Plymouth. Right. So I got to Cardiff. And because I'm a single 18 year old guy, <laughs> I just got shucked in this room with like a bunch of men. Um, these like beds which are burnt, half burnt, no bed sheets or anything. That, that was my accommodation. So, what was so there any sort of trouble in those sorts of places, or was it, or, or you all in the same sort um, of situation? Was, there was I mean, the biggest issue was uh, heating. <laughs> Is what? Uh, eating? Heating. Oh, heating. Because uh, a lot of people that who just came from like another country yeah. and they would turn up the heater to the max. Mm -hmm. And I'm, you know, I'm used to living used in the UK to, yeah. for a while and it'd be a fight to like, oh, I'd go and turn down the heating and they'd go turn up the heating. And it was, <laughs> it's bizarre. And you know, the food was not really edible. I was, I was not. 
Well, you're not used to that at that point, are you? Because you're you're living a a regular English life for ten years. Yeah, well, on on five quid a week or whatever it was. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, we yeah, still still managed. You know what I mean? Yeah. Healthy. You know, at that point, I was still fit. I was training jujitsu, um, and that's where <laughs> my uh, unfitness started, I suppose. Because uh, the cheapest food I could afford at the time was Watsis, because it's like. You can get, you know, the knockoff what's this? Yeah. And you can get a whole pack for a few quid. <laughs> and when you're hungry, you just like have... Is that what you was living off? Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> it was even like, you know, you, you're, treated, you're not treated like people when you, you know, even when you go to get your food, for, you know what they're you not? You. You're just, you know, you've, you've been shouted at, you've just been really? down on. I mean, for the, for the first night I got there, I had to wait for hours and hours to even like be allocated a room. And uh, yeah, I was there for a while, and then I was like, I need to be with my family. I, you know, I'm I'm like the support for my family, and uh, they were like, yeah, yeah, we'll uh, we'll put you in in Plymouth with your family, and then they said, okay, you we found you, uh, we're gonna move you to Plymouth, and the next day, they arranged transport. I got there, and they were like, you're not going to Plymouth, you're going to London. <laughs> and if you don't get in the taxi, um, you don't have accommodation or support, and you'll be homeless again. So I had to make a choice whether I like try to fight this or get on uh, the taxi and go to London. <laughs> so I'm guessing you got on and went to London, yeah? Yeah, I mean, after yeah, being homeless really. once, I, was yeah. like, I'm not, I'm, yeah. I don't want to go through that again. I can't imagine you got much fight on you at that point, mate, after mm. all that, to be fair. But between that time, though, I still experienced so much kindness from people. So there's always two sides to this. So, you know, my my friends I made when I first came to Cardiff, the church family, they came and helped us, helped me. So Peter, um, he's about, he's sort of over 80 now. Really nice guy. He came and took me out for meals when he could, and you know, just talked to me. Actually, like made me feel like I'm I'm human. I'm you know. So it's just disgusting that that you made yeah. to feel like that. Yeah, and then I had another some friends in Gloucester got together. They got me a gym membership because I couldn't use the toilets there. I mean, it was it's a point where I couldn't even sit on the toilets. It's so no bad. No way. So I, I I they got me a gym membership just so I could use their showers and the toilets. And <laughs> yeah, and then I got to London, and it, it was even worse. I didn't think it could, it could no way. Get... What was even worse in London than yeah, it was in Cardiff? I was put, the, put in this place in Kilburn, uh, in London. It was you no. Know, I would open the drawer to put something in. You see cockroaches crawling about, and you're like, "Is this the UK? Like, <laughs> you don't, you're not supposed to see cockroaches." <laughs> Genuinely, I don't think I've ever seen one. In the UK, <laughs> not the UK. No, I've, yeah. no, I've yeah. never seen one. Never no. seen them in Tenerife, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and, and you see mice and you know, running about. That's normal. Um, and then I, I you know, went to go to the toilet, which is shared between about twelve people. Had no seat. <laughs> Thankfully, I was quite fit at the time, so I could <laughs> squat for a bit. <laughs> God. <laughs> God. And like the water as well. Like uh, it was either freezing cold water or boiling hot water. So yeah, cold so showers. I, <laughs> yeah, well, I couldn't have cold showers. <laughs> so I had to get like a little cut. I used to mix the water. Is that how you how you yeah, showering? Yeah, oh yeah. my god! And honestly, that I I got to my room one day. I was literally broke down crying. I was like, uh, "What have I done for me to like be in a situation like this?" It's like you know, all, all throughout my life, I've tried my best. You know, I've never had a detention at school. I've never been pulled up on anything. I tried to do everything the right way and I'm still having to go through all of this. Yeah, it must just be torturous as well because you had a period, like you say, of of relatively normal living and then you've suddenly just gone all the way back to yeah. like almost day one and then even even a sort of back step again. Yeah, yeah. Were you were you able to stay in touch with your, your mum and your sister at this point? Yeah, I mean, I was still able to call them. Yeah, okay. um, and when I could, uh, I, I found this uh, amazing deal on Megabus you could get from London to Plymouth for a pound. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I, I've, I used to get the bus down to Plymouth. How long did that take on the mega bus? Though? Oh, it's, like, it takes forever, doesn't like, it? I think, I think I've done it five, once. six hours. Is it? But at least I got to see my... Oh, yeah, of course. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just wondering. And I, I used to take all of my... You know, I had a bag about this big, carry it back and forth, because I can't. You know, I'm in a room with random people I never met. Yeah, they before. just take everything, wouldn't they? And, yeah, and I can't leave anything yeah. 
and uh, yeah, it was a bizarre time. And, and again, I think this is just such a, a reflection of you, mate, and you, like you say, your integrity, because I feel like so many people have just got down the Plymouth and just gone, oh, I'll just stay here then, and just keep on the floor or something. But you kept going back to where you were meant to be. Yeah, I mean, and I, I just didn't want to do anything that I would morally hate myself for later on in life. And also as well, I imagine it's, you don't want to do anything wrong because it's an excuse then for them to say, that's it, you broke the rules and you're back off to wherever. You know what I mean? That's, that's another... the fear that keeps people from complaining about the situations. But it's, it's so unhumane. That's yeah. what I can't understand. We talk about, you know, the amount of money in the UK, you know, we got fucking parades for the king, we're doing this and that. And then genuine asylum seekers who, who need our help coming over and we're treating them like that. It's just... I just I, I can I can't imagine the system in place to say that that's okay to treat another human being like that. Yeah, and, and I think what's what's kind of standing out as me is the length of fucking time that this has just been going on. Yeah, for. Like, I, I, you know I get it for like maybe well, I don't, but you can kind of understand it to some extent for like a, a, a initial short period of time. Well, even if it took say like twelve months, mm -hmm. say on a on a thing, it was like okay, it's a lot of paperwork. They have to obviously rifle through people as well to make sure if it's a genuine asylum, not an asylum, you know, all that type of stuff. I understand, but you know, it should have a cut off point. It should have a point where it's like okay, it's been twelve months now. What are we doing? We need to make a decision whether they go back or they stay, and, and it doesn't go past that. You're almost like you're in an open prison. You know, he can't. No, I couldn't carry on with my education. I couldn't work yeah i have the freedom to like walk around but that's you know yeah. not much i could do but you just know, you, you know that there's there's obviously some people in the uk who obviously you know have their opinions which you know are their own and that's fine but we'll just label asylum seekers with freeloading and, and not yeah. working and not contributing and 15 years of trying it's, yeah, it's fucking. It's I, th I think as well the the preconception as well. They pro most I, I genuinely believe that most people probably don't know that they're only on five pound a day. You know, asylum seekers get five pound a day. They don't know that the situation that they're living in, the the sort of accommodation they're living in, they probably think that it's the same sort of thing as an unemployed English person where they get universal credit and they get a free house and they get this and they get that and it's everything. You know what I mean? And that's the sort of the, the sort of perception that I think narrow-minded people have. Do you get what I mean? And it's just not the fucking case. I've, I've done a, uh, so I, I used to do youth work. I used to volunteer as a youth worker um, during this time before I got my thing sorted. And we did a workshop in uh, in Whitley. Right, and okay. Was, um, so the youth program I was working for, they were doing this thing called a diversity project. And that's to try challenge the uh, young people's opinion on, people from other cultures and sort of help them understand a bit more yeah. and what we found is that they've been taught a certain thing from you know generations yeah. that they they blindly believe it without even challenging it yeah. and me and my sister did this you know talk and explaining like you know what the situation is what we've been through and it, it was like an eye-opening experience for them yeah and, i can imagine and, and they were like okay you know this is uh this is not what we thought. Well, I think most people are not, I think, okay, I sort of talk loosely here, but I, I don't think most people are bad people. And I think with ignorance is, does come from generational ignorance. I think their parents are probably ignorant. And then their parents, you know, each generation is slightly more ignorant. You know, as as it comes down, it's, it, is, it is getting better. But again, like you said, it's, it's that just generational yeah. ignorance. But I think as well, you know, obviously there is a lot of poverty in the UK. So yeah. people, when they've got, when they're in their own shit situation, mm. you know, they, they just don't care for other people's shit situations yeah. Yeah. and they will just form opinions and, and bad attitudes about things. And, That's it. you know, it's, it's a tricky one. Can you tell us a little bit more about your volunteering? Cause you touched on it in Gloucester, but we didn't really sort of get into any of the details. Um, I started with street pastoring. Mm -hmm. So that's where we go out in the streets between like 10 PM and 4 AM uh, volunteering. And we just basically look out for people who are homeless, oh, they might be too drunk, um, first aid. You might have met before, mate. <laughs> I, was, I, I was about to say, uh, Jesus. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if they're, you know, if they're too drunk, we'd like give them some water, soap them up, help them, and help them get a taxi. If they have any, you know, wounds or anything or cuts or anything, we'd, you know, treat them, give them flip-flops, especially, you know, girls who take their heels off and they're walking through broken glass. It's quite common. 
uh, homeless people would give them uh, space blankets. They're called mm, so they're like, like foily ones. Yeah, that's yeah, it. Yeah. yeah, and then obviously we used to get food vouchers as well. One of the cafes used to give us some vouchers we could give them. So that's how I started uh, volunteering, and then during my street passer training, I came into contact with a guy called Rob, who was running a um, youth program, and that's helping youth in like deprived areas. So I started volunteering uh, there through him. I contacted him saying I want to volunteer, and then I was doing that for a while, and I was also um, helping with a project called Goshen Home which is where we have five places in a home and we have people who are ex-homeless or recovering from addiction and we help them get into independent living. Mm -hmm. So it's like a mentorship program almost where we each person gets a, a befriender and a mentor. A befriender is, you know, just someone they can you know, go out fishing or whatever, some activities, mm -hmm. have someone to talk to. And a mentor gives them like a structured plan on how they can get to a better standard where they can start being independent, get back to work, get back with their families. That's uh, some of the things. Some yeah. amazing stuff that way. Yeah. That's, uh... It was really fulfilling being, I mean, that's one of the reasons I believe what I've been through, God's put me through to help other people. Because I can almost, you know, you can never relate to a person exactly, but you can kind of get an idea of what someone's going through yeah. and almost get like a, a compassion towards them. Mm. So that's wicked, man. Um, so, where do we get to with your story, mate? So you're in London. So how long are you in London for? Uh, I believe for a few months. I can't remember exactly how long. Um, so I got there and my mum and sister went to this uh, local organisation called DCRS. So this they were then called one of the refugee something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, basically, they help uh, refugees and asylum seekers. Okay. And they are brilliant, brilliant people. Um, and they managed to get a lawyer to write to the Home Office saying, what you've done is unlawful, you've separated the family. And, and you know, as soon as they got that letter, magically I've got moved to Plymouth. Oh, wow. <laughs> right, OK. And, I, and I've got a shout out to my friend, Toby. So one of the friends I went to school with, he's got a good job in London and um, he had a nice accommodation. So he kindly let me come and stay there every now and then so I could actually, you know, oh <laughs> feel a bit normal. I think I think you can see the theme where I'm constantly trying to feel normal, like I belong somewhere and, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and kind of <laughs> that that was that was really, really kind of him to offer his place, you know, for me to, to come and stay with him. Yeah. And even friends in Gloucester, you know, offered, me, uh, for, offered for me to come and stay with them for weeks at a time to just, you know, feel 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 <laughs> you know we used to do things we used to do as you know normal mates you know go to the gym hang out yeah. and in those moments you kind of forget about everything and try to like enjoy that moment because you, you start to appreciate things a lot more once you know what you're missing mm -hmm. like you know friendships training gym things like that once when you can't do that anymore you start to realize how much it meant for you just being able to call up a mate and say, how are you? How's it going? Like, do you want to come hang out? When you're all the way in London and your mates are like five, six hours away from you and you haven't got that, you just feel very like alone. Did you have any um, mental health uh, problems or support or use any charities that, that supported that? Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I was having a lot of mental health, like stress and anxiety, a bit of depression. And for me personally, what helped me was my faith. Um, in jiu -jitsu and jiu-jitsu so being a Christian obviously I used to go to church yeah. and that used to help me a lot the community you know the messages and also I started training jiu-jitsu around when I was doing A-levels okay. you know when I started to um, get a bit older I guess yeah. and I felt like um, I wanted to do something to help me with my stress yeah. and I had a friend who is now I think 
he just got his black belt, I believe. Oh, He's an man. assassin, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's a guy called Conrad, Polish guy. Okay. Oh, God, you. that makes it even worse. Yeah. yeah. Oh, We're yeah. strong black yeah. belt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, I'll steal clear of him. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, we know a couple <laughs> of strong uh, brown yeah. belts, don't we? So. Honestly, the way he moves, you, you just look at him. Like, yeah. <laughs> how is that possible? Yeah. Um, and it, it was always like out there, like, you know, living life stress free. I mean, obviously he always has his own issues and problems, but the way he was living, I was like, you know what? I want to do what he's doing to see what, you know, what it can do for me. And then I spoke to him and me and my mate Phil, we went down to jiu-jitsu. And up until that point, I was lifting weights at school. Yes. Uh, you know, not properly, you know, just normal bro. As, bro as we do, uh, <laughs> bro lifts at 18, <laughs> yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Good. Chest and arms. Just chest and arms, <laughs> as I was about to say, no legs. <laughs> yeah. You know, so I still thought I was quite a strong lad. Um, but I've never had an issue with, with my ego, thankfully. I've always been quite humble. But I went there and I've never been athletic in my life. So I've never played any sports. I guess I never got a chance to get into sports yeah. when I was younger. So I was very, very scared. And I got there and I couldn't tell my left from my right. <laughs> like, <laughs> Imagine you know, the first your first thing you do is like a shrimp, isn't it? When you go jujitsu, and I was there for like weeks trying to learn how to do a shrimp. And I felt like this is a whole new world. Like you know, I'm really bad at this. <laughs> and usually, like when I'm really bad at something, that pushes me to like get better at it. And that's when I was like, all right, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna get better at it. How did you think it helped you with your mental health, jujitsu? Um, it it was one of those things where like initially it was. The release of stress from just doing physical activity you know you just go there you learn new things the, the time you're there your brain is completely focused on what you're doing especially for me because i'm not a physical like naturally physically talented person i had to really focus to like you know learn these different things and then we started sparring quite early on and that i found was like it puts me in a situation where like i guess i'm not sure how to explain this but you know, in real life, back in the day, you'd have like fear from animals like bears or lions yes. and you get like a normal stress reaction and you either run or fight that lion or whatever you do. I mean, I don't know who fought lions. Fight, but fight or flight. <laughs> fight or flight. Either way, yeah. you, you burn off that stress, you know, that cortisol. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But now you get your daily stress you know, from workplace or whatever you might be dealing with, but you don't get to burn that stress that way. And in jiu-jitsu, you actually get put in a real survival situation. Yeah. Someone is trying to choke you up <laughs> and you, you are fighting for your life in a way, but in a safe environment. So it gives you a very clear head, doesn't it? Mm. Yeah. Very clear mind. Yeah, we've talked loads about it already on previous episodes, how, yeah, you, you're basically playing a, a game of who can kill who with whose body. <laughs> um, but that physical adversity does, I find, certainly dials down the stress of everyday life and everyday stresses, so... Definitely, yeah. To, so to begin with, it was the physical activity and, and the beauty of jiu-jitsu where it can put you in a situation where you feel like this is the end of the world, but mm. it's actually not. Yeah. There is always a way out. you just got to find it. Yeah. You know, you, you've got to keep trying. If you give up, you won't find it. Yeah. So it kind of almost encourages you to keep trying, keep thinking about it. And then over time, I started to build like great friendships. And um, you know, that was really helpful, like, even when everything was going wrong, you turn up to jiu-jitsu and people start roasting you. <laughs> you're like, okay, this is some sort of normality. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, I've really got to be thankful for my coach in Gloucester, Murray and Chris. Um, such a kind-hearted person, you know. Like I said, I was in very on a limited budget and I fell in love with jiu-jitsu, then I, I just couldn't keep training. And he, you know, he said, you know what, Cal, just train. And that... Just let you train for free? Yeah. So nice. I trained there for years for free. Yeah. And... <laughs> but things like that you never forget though, will you? You never yeah. forget that, will you? What, that was the, uh, what was the guy's name? Amari Burton. He's yeah, a shout, black shout belt now. Legend. Uh, Another I mean, savage. His, his, pressure, his pressure is insane. And then Chris Davis is my other coach. He's also a black belt now. Mm. And uh, yeah, th those two guys, I mean... Also growing up, like from when I was younger, uh, Jiu-Jitsu also gives like really good role models in a way. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I've got my role models at church and at Jiu-Jitsu and they all both give different pers perspectives. 
like uh, Mari, for example, like he's so good at like teaching you how to de deal with adversity. You know, even like, you no, know, I mean, I got made homeless. First thing he did was let's meet up for a coffee, talk about our options and see what we can do rather than be like, oh, let's panic and all that. But he was like, you know, he calmed me down, he's had a coffee. And that alone just meant so much to me. And just, you know, he's running a business. What was his gym called? Uh, Gracie Barra Gloucester. Gracie Barra Gloucester. And uh, yeah, he's running a business. He didn't have to let me train for free. And that's just a testament for how much mm. of an amazing person he is. And generally, I find these people that train jiu-jitsu are the same. They're very, very kind people. They generally find themselves through jiu-jitsu as mm, well. 100%. You really get to learn who you are, especially when you're in a situation where you're really struggling and your ego's <laughs> under attack. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you gotta be like, who am I? Like, yeah. you either learn to deal with it, humble yourself and carry on, or you quit. Yeah, man, it's cool. But yeah, definitely lands uh, teach you to be calm under pressure and yeah, trying to evaluate sort of situations. So that's wicked, man. Um, so where do we get to with your story, mate? So you got you got to Plymouth. Yeah, I got to Plymouth and I was given the same accommodation as my mum and sister. Amazing. Um, well, it and, was and, a, and what was that like? Well, I mean, <laughs> it's much better, much, much, much better. It was a one bedroom uh, flat. Um, I was given like a cupboard and they put a single bed there, but I was happy. I was with my family um, and my friends from Gloucester came to visit me often as well. Yeah. Uh, my pastor came to visit me from Gloucester as well. And we found a good church in Plymouth. Um, apart from that, I went, tried to find a good place to train Jiu Jitsu as well. So things things started to become a bit more, I guess, settled. Mm. But our case is still going on. Mm. So I'm still like um, really stressing out about it, fighting the lawyer, fighting against the Home Office. And also um, at the same time, starting to worry about my future. You know, I've it's been years since I left school. Mm. I finished my A-levels in like 2012, I believe. Mm. And what year did you arrive in Plymouth? In 2017, I believe, okay, so 18. Yeah, a good five or six years then, yeah. Yeah. And thankfully, you know, when I finished my A-levels and I told my school I can't go to uni, they were like, come back and do more A-levels if you want. So I went and did more. Okay. So I said, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I studied like seven A-levels. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> got, got loads of UCAS points. And, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then yeah, I, I was really starting to worry about my own future as well. It's like... You know, I always wanted to uh, do medicine and help people. I was also wanted to do research as well. Um, Alzheimer's was a passion of mine, like to f try find a cure for it. Mm -hmm. And you know, when I, when we were in school, when we and me and my mates were like talking about our plans, that's why we were talking about, our, oh yeah, you're gonna be a doctor, we're gonna work together, blah blah. And um, you know, I still I still kept that dream. Like I didn't want to give up. And it start like you know when like your options start closing in. Yeah. You know, because your A-levels have to be within five years for you to do your, um, do, do medicine in most universities. So now it's gone over five years. I'm starting to think, hmm, this is going to be a struggle. You know, to go towards a graduate route, I don't have another degree either. So um, that, that's when I start to, to really panic and my mental health start to go down a bit. What did they need exactly? What were they, what did you need to present to them in order to actually get this across the line? So what they wanted was proof that you were going through uh, persecution and and evidence for that. And the problem with that is obviously if you are escaping a country, you don't just wait to collect evidence before escaping. <laughs> of course, you know? yeah. <laughs> Guys, wait, let me just take a picture. <laughs> yeah. At the mob coming yeah. out, okay. <laughs> I mean, we, we had uh, lots of evidence like the police books that they signed and yeah. You know, videos and pictures of certain things from past. Mm. Um, but the problem was, because I, since I turned 18, I had my own case. And that evidence that we had doesn't apply to me. What? Because <laughs> I'm my own person now. And they're like, you're right, you have to start your own claim and you can't be a part of your parents' asylum claim. 
Was that the same for your sister then as well when she yeah, became an adult? Yeah, yeah. Fucking hell. And they like what, to, so they like to fucking waste money, fuck don't they, me. fucking around? That shouldn't have been the case. Well, of course not, yeah. because you come here at, what, age 12? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? It's not, we, uh, we came here as a child. We should carry on the case as a, as a, you know, as we came. But well, as a family, yeah, of course you should, yeah. surely. And then what? So they changed that. That's that. It's just yeah. It just feels like we had to keep going around circles and circles when the process should have been quite straightforward. And in the end, they did accept that our evidence was enough. There was persecution in Sri Lanka, and you know it's all legit. But it took them so long to actually get there. Mm. And during that time, we were going through that. There's a few like documentaries going on about the Home Office. People who used to work for the Home Office said, you know, they have like a uh, chart where they can mark how many cases they've rejected and they get bonuses based on that. And there's so much pressure to go through so many cases mm. and reject them. They don't actually have the time to go through each case. <laughs> so we, <laughs> which explains like the mistakes they made in our cases. So, that, so you, you think some, at times people probably weren't even reading it, reading the information, they were just rejecting I mean, it. The judge found that they didn't read our documents properly. I mean, even on our court case, the Home Office um, lawyer hadn't, Looked, our docu- looked through our documents. He asked for time out to go through the documents and we had a file about this much. <laughs> and you know, within that time, I doubt he's even been able to go through that. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, it's, it's quite bizarre. And the, the thing is, we can't afford better lawyers. We have to stick with who they gave us. And thankfully in the end, we had uh, lawyers who were passionate about our case. That's absolutely mental, isn't it? Because well, you're, you're pe- stuck, aren't you? You're absolutely stuck. You've got no money, no accommodation. You, you're waiting on them. and They're not even reading your fucking case. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, it just seems absolutely bizarre that yeah. our government are running that like that. I think it? what it's makes it really it, though. <laughs> but it is <laughs> though, isn't it? <laughs> you know, I know, yeah. We shouldn't expect any better. I'm not saying that, but it's just, it's just crazy that it's actually like that, isn't it? You yeah, know what I mean? Like, it's actually you know, all the money and all the resources yeah, we have yeah. in this country. And then we're still... Well, it's just when you're making more work for yourself, isn't it? You're yeah. wasting those resources, fucking running around in circles and chasing your tail and stuff. Yeah, it's bonkers. No, I was curious because, um, yeah, it's such a long fucking time. I think what makes it bizarre is um, there are some people who are not genuine asylum seekers or refugees. Yeah. And they probably have, like, a lot of fabricated evidence and things where they, that raises the bar of what they expect yeah. quite high. So if you actually have a genuine like uh, situation and you don't take time to collect evidence, you can't match up with these like... <laughs> can't start fabricating loads yeah, of stuff. Yeah. So I think that's part of the problem, you know. And then the battle continues with the Home Office. Yeah. <laughs> so, so draw that to an end for us. Um, so again, we've got this uh, legal aid lawyers. Um, the, the lawyers we had couldn't continue anymore, so we got another set of lawyers. And they were really, really good at fighting for us. Mm. You know, uh, one of the barristers uh, we had, she was amazing. And what she managed to do is, um, excuse me, uh, she managed to get us what's called a private life grant. So that's where you go. We've lived here in the UK for certain years. You've built a private life in the UK and therefore you have a right to be here. So that's a two and a half year grant. Yeah, for two and a half years you can be here and then you can apply to extend it. But that doesn't mean you can actually stay in the UK, so you still... (laughs) (laughs) So so we still have to keep fighting for our refugee uh, status. So then, uh, again, we kept on fighting and what we found was uh, the Home Office hadn't looked at the documents again properly. I mean, at one point they sent a letter saying my sister should be sent back to Nigeria. <laughs> We're from Sri Lanka. <laughs> so they just copied and pasted someone else's claim on our, on, our, on our paperwork and then sent it to us. So the judge basically said the Home Office have been really incompetent in looking at our, our documents. They've actually affected our life really in a really bad way. And for them to actually look at it properly this time and read through everything. And then that, then we got granted our refugee status finally in 2020 or something, I believe. And <laughs> that 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 day was just, yeah. It must have been absolute elation, wasn't it? Like you could have finally stay and then just permanent res- residency, yeah? Um, so I have to apply for like citizenships um, in a certain number of years, but at least now I'm safe. I'm not in like threat to be deported. 
and uh, you know I can start to feel a bit more normal like I belong somewhere <laughs> which is you know, amazing and I almost had like separation anxiety with my my stress <laughs> 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 it, was, it was it was bizarre because we were all like what do we do with ourselves now like the, all this stress is you know taken off yeah man it's amazing so so talk us through like you you kind of touched on it a little bit but just tell us like exactly how that felt and 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 how did your like mom and your sister react to that as well yeah <laughs> It, it just felt such a relief. Like it felt like you know you were in a war for years and years, mm-hmm. and almost in like a open prison, like I said. And suddenly you you were free. Like I could you know I could start working. I could start you know building a future now. And I'm safe. I don't have to worry about being sent back and all the dangers you know that has. And it, and you know I could actually travel to other places as well. Like you know visit different countries. Which we weren't allowed to do. Oh, I was about to say, so, yeah, you I forgot. Like, like, you yeah. couldn't even go anywhere, could you? Yeah, yeah, yeah like he says, mm-hmm. yeah, like, yeah, so it's just prison, like yeah. a whole world opened up. Like I actually felt like I can live now. <laughs> yeah. So does that? As so, you're are you still a refugee at this point? Yes. Yeah. So, okay. But yeah. but that allows you to to work. And are you now back in education as well? Yeah. So when you when you get your grant for private life, yeah. you can start working. I think that's a limit limited amount of hours, okay. and then as a refugee, you can work full time and yeah so I started working um so the place I volunteered for youth work they offered me a youth work job so I started uh, working as a youth worker and I also started uh, doing some security with uh, Axion putting those, uh, putting those jiu-jitsu skills to use <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, um, yeah it was it was such a nice feeling to finally start to you know earn my own money I was about to say what was it like out of the, that first paycheck <laughs> uh, that was amazing and first thing I did was uh, buy little bits for my friends and everyone that like helped did them. you, <laughs> I, you know, I, I still want to treat them properly but I'm slowly starting to sort of you know show my appreciation to them because mm. amount of people that supported us over these last 15 years and still to this day are in contact it's it just shows the, you know restores the faith in humanity mm. yeah it does so yeah. many good people there yeah it's amazing man is your is your mum still like working age is she she's uh in her 50s now okay uh, is she able to to do, do be a doctor over here or has she got a she's gone back into education now okay. um so she has to do her english certifications yeah. which she's doing now and then we'll have to see what options she has from there because she's obviously been a long time since yeah of course she's yeah yeah, um, yeah. But fortunately, uh, my sister managed to find this uh, foundation year program at Plymouth University. Mm-hmm. But she actually got onto that before um, we had our refugee status because she found this uh, scholarship that helps asylum seekers. And they only offer one per year, I think. And, and she got one? Uh, she got that. Oh, wow. So, um, they managed. They paid for her first year of uh, university. What, what course has she done? Uh, she's also doing medicine. She's just finishing her second year. Yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah, she was allowed to go to university because of that. That's really cool. And uh, obviously, I didn't apply for that. I wanted my sister to go. And then, uh, by the time I got to apply, yeah. I had my refugee status, so I could apply for student finance. Oh, yeah. So um, I'm going to get student finance from September. Right. So, and then did you then start in med school have you got to do like an access course now so what's um, the journey so I've, I've done what's called a gateway year yeah. uh, so that's if you've been out of education yeah. for a certain time mm-hmm. and you meet certain circumstances foundation brings you up to speed where you can go into the first year mm-hmm. so year zero is it? year zero yeah. yeah Yeah. so I've just finished my year zero um, pass it times. yeah of course so he's got the course <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So uh, what's your long-term goal then? I want to be a doctor uh, and hopefully go into surgery. I'm yet to find out what I'm good at. Mm-hmm. That's the thing with medicine. There's so many options, so many different areas you can go into. But I'm still passionate about doing research into Alzheimer's. Mm-hmm. So that's something I'll definitely be looking at. Yeah, man, that's a fucking horrible, horrible disease. I, mean, I lost my uncle to that. It's just, yeah. yeah. It's, 
just eats people's lives away from them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, mate, with all your experience, you kind of mentioned how um, how kind of you feel that, that it was kind of God's work to some extent to give you this kind of experience to to kind of help others. And there's there's going to be you know sort of I imagine thousands, probably tens of thousands of people in in similar scenarios. Um, do you do you kind of have any kind words for those people if they're in a similar position? Yeah, definitely. Um, my my main point would be to keep hope like hope is what drives people that's what drives you know dreams and everything and keep that hope and keep yourself accountable that's one thing that will stop you from going off the rails you know getting yourself in a situation where you're sat there feeling sorry for yourself actually hold yourself accountable it's okay to like uh, be upset be sad I've done that but hold yourself to a point where don't let yourself be there for too long there are things you can do. Find a sport you like. Find people you can talk to. There's so many opportunities out there for you to start doing something and bring some full f- fulfillment. And uh, yeah, I think just just start doing something. Start somewhere and then you'll build from there. Just don't get into a situation where you think the world's unfair, everything's against you. There's always one thing you can do to start that process. You know, even, For example, like, if you haven't been to the gym for a while and you want to get back into the gym, start by filling your water bottle up. Do that every day and that becomes a habit. And then now, every time you fill your, your water bottle, you start go to the gym. So it's that little things you can do to help yourself get yourself out of that situation you're in. And just, yeah, don't give up hope. It's never too late. You're never too old. You're never too big. You're never too small. Everything's possible. Appreciate you coming on, mate. Yeah, thank thank you. You. Glad, uh, glad you're fucking sorted and you're staying. And get back on the fucking mat soon, man. Thank you. Definitely. Appreciate it. See Thanks, you, man. Mate. Thank you. Thank you.